Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Brew, and today we are talking about the Tenth Commandment, which is Thou Shalt Not Covet. Paul says of this commandment in his letter to the Romans, chapter 7, I had not known sin but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law sin was dead, for I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death, for sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good." Paul also says of covetousness in Colossians chapter 3 that it is idolatry. He's listing a lot of things that do not characterize or ought not characterize the life of a believer, and he gets to covet covetousness mm -hmm. and says kind of off to the side, which is idolatry, which kind of loops the 10th commandment back to the first commandment, which I think is really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so we get to the 10th commandment and find that the law reaches even to the heart. What does it mean to covet? Well, the word is sort of ambiguous by itself. It means it means to have a strong desire for something, but the, the Greek and, and, and the Hebrew words involved don't necessarily prejudice one way or the other. You can have a strong desire for a good thing. You can have a strong desire for a bad thing. For instance, in Deuteronomy, God tells his people that uh, at the feast, they can spend their tithe, proportion of their tithe money on flesh or strong drink or whatsoever your soul lusteth after. That may be a little surprising. <laughs> Paul tells the Corinthians to covet earnestly the best gifts, and he's talking about gifts of the Spirit there, and then moves on to talk about love, charity. And Jesus, at, at the beginning of the Last Supper, says, with desire, I have desired to, to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So, again, I, I have desired strongly. I have coveted, even lusted, as long as we understand the context. So the first thing that comes to mind is that for human beings, strong feelings, strong passions are not a bad thing. Goodbye to Stoics and ascetics. <laughs> but it's not enough to say, on the other hand, but I feel deeply about this. Good for you. A lot of people feel deeply about a lot of things. It's it, We need to turn to Scripture and see what kind of things we are allowed to want properly and what things we shouldn't want properly. Uh, and the law has already given us a list of things we shouldn't want. We shouldn't want to take our neighbor's life, damage his reputation, steal his wife, steal his... Uh, authority and the honor that's due to him and so on. And, and this is sort of where I think we, we we should at least throw this out here so we remember to get back to it. <laughs> we, live in, we live in a day where love is the defining mark of politics. Mm -hmm. But everyone has a different, uh, different take on what love means for one group, which we tend to call liberal. Love means passionately caring about the poor, disadvantaged, and socially marginalized, those who don't have their stake in the table or whatever. And we need to care about those people. And we need to do things to help those people. And uh, we, are, we need to be sincere in our desires. We need to be passionate in our desires. We need to love humanity. We need to want social justice for all, personal autonomy, and we need to be committed to change. And this needs to happen now. Do not ask us too closely about by what standards we may be operating. Because, well, love is self-explanatory, right? As long it's also as I love. the intention rather than the results. Because yeah. I think when we look at a lot of liberal policies, we don't come out with a result that makes people better off, that would be my argument. Well, but, but what happened is that we weren't moved properly by love. We cheated. We stumbled. We cut short. Give us more money. Give us more time. Give us more power. Give us the freedom to act in a truly loving way. And we will give you results because if it's if it feels so right, how can it be wrong? <laughs> uh, love is the defining virtue. And if we are acting, truly acting in love, then the results have to be good. I mean, they're loving, a loving action produces loving results. It's that simple. 
Then there are cons the, the conservatives who do not trust human nature to that extent and imply that uh, yes, man is, or state flat out, man is inclined to self-love more than he ought to be. And, and both in uh, the free market and in the workings of government, he's going to want stuff that probably he shouldn't want, but <laughs> as long as we use this guy's self-interest to check that guy's self-interest and we let it work out in the market or shake out in a uh, balance of powers and politics, you know, it's pretty much the best you can hope for. And, and yes, we want justice and we want liberty. And we don't trust those liberals over there because they're probably commie sympathizers and they're certainly victims <laughs> of their own sentimentality. They get all Naivete. gushy. They're bleeding hearts, yes. Mm -hmm. But we love too. We we love people. We love we we love this country. They love people in general. We love this country. We love God. We love the standards, <laughs> the liberty, the justice this country was founded upon. And most of them, I suspect, actually believe that they do and that they, they probably are trying to base more on tradition than on the thoughts of any one man or the, the philosophy of any one man or even group of men. They, they see that the human depravity, self-interest, uh, has its advantages. It's not all bad. It's not all good. But there's enough bad there that if we manage to balance it off against each other, we can have a pretty decent society where people have freedom. Um, but don't don't listen to the liberals. And of course, the liberals point fingers at the conservatives and call them heartless, unloving, cold-blooded. Everybody here is very passionate. But if you start asking them for some absolute standard that will define what they ought to be, what 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 is this compassion thing you speak of? What does it mean? How how do you measure it? How do you know if you've got it right? Do you just keep waiting until we get something on the other end that? makes us all happy. What if we keep screwing it up? Is it just because we've never done it right? You know, the old slogan, Marxism has failed everywhere it's been tried because they didn't do it right. But let us try it and we'll get it right. So the problem's not with the system. The problem's with the people who put it into or tried to implement it imperfectly. I do always love the hubris of that kind of statement too. It's like, <laughs> well, <clears throat> these people... Stalin and, and Lenin and, and go run down the list. No. They weren't smart enough. And I am. <laughs> <laughs> or they weren't committed enough. They didn't love people enough. Mm -hmm. they, there was some selfishness. There's some basic capitalistic ideas left in their craw. But I come with a pure heart. And therefore, I'll, it'll be different this time. Yeah, the hubris is incredible. We, we think that we can do it right when everybody else has failed. Never questioning that maybe our basic assumptions are simply horribly wrong. But that's not something we're likely to do uh, until the Holy Spirit begins poking at our hearts. I will um, also throw in here our libertarian friends. And we probably all have libertarian friends. And here I'm talking um, philosophical libertarianism. I'm thinking Ayn Rand first of all, but others too who are... Uh, who, who would freely confess that any kind of system has to begin with man's own self-interest. Now, to recognize it exists, good, it does. The Bible calls it sin. To say that um, you, can, you can create a market where sin plays against sin, yeah, with some success you can do that. Uh, but to stake everything, all of love on, well, here's an Ayn Rand comment I assume you'll not like. Only a rationally selfish man, a man of self-esteem, is capable of love because he's the only man capable of holding firm, consistent, uncompromising, unbetrayed values. Now, you can help me out with that, but I think what she's saying is when I am standing on me as the most important thing in the universe and, and, and the thing to which I must cater first, then uh, you always know where I stand and I always know where we stand. And then we can begin to talk from there because I know the same thing about you. And I feel it, like that's also really naive. <laughs> <laughs> like people are irrational literally every day. Um, you know, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But like how, how does Ayn Rand say this with a straight face? Like has she met a person? Well, she knows her own heart, Emily. 
Sure, she does. Uh-huh. <laughs> I think the Bible says something about us knowing our own hearts. And, and, <laughs> but and, and, we can't. And, and how we don't, yeah. Um, but, but the point here is we, we've looked vaguely at, at three philosophical political positions. And I think we could all agree that somewhere in each of them, there is some degree of truth and some degree of merit. Mm-hmm. And depending on yeah. who's talking and who the spokesman is, you might get something better than you might get from other spokesmen. And, and and I think we can all agree that there are nice people in all of these mm-hmm. groups. That's not the point. The point is we are looking for a foundation that can define love in a way that's universal, timeless, meaningful, and that actually lifts people up and helps them rather than grind them underfoot. Marxists talk about love a lot. Um, why did they have to build walls to keep people into the Soviet Union? Because they were being and loved. East Germany. And East and Germany. Cuba is uh, yeah. an island, so they didn't need walls. But people still try to escape. <laughs> in, in boats, yeah. Um, or did, did these people hate being loved so much? Or again, are we going to fall back on? But you see, what happened is that those countries didn't get it right. Well, it happens a lot, it seems. And my, my experience uh, with people of all sorts uh, especially over the last several years, has been that they do not have a definition for love. And um, the one thing that seems to be included is this idea of, of automatic, complete, universal acceptance. I accept you just as you are. I will not try to change you. I will wish for your well-being on the terms you have set for yourself. As, as long as you don't hurt anybody, I guess, Hurt being defined rather strictly. I mean, you, as long as if you're not taking out a sledgehammer and going for their head. You, Although that's okay if it's in the name of love. Well, yeah, there's that, isn't there? What and, if that's, and words are hurtful. Words are hurtful. And not um, saying words are hurtful. That's know. right. Silence is violence. And and, and so we're, we're left with this confusion. I, uh, I'm adopt, adopting an alternate lifestyle of a sexual nature. So... If you love me, you will not ex- only accept me, you will not criticize me. You will uh, facilitate this. You will speak well of me publicly. And it, should it be necessary to pass any laws that will do more of that on a grander scale, you are absolutely obligated in love to do that because otherwise you're an oppressor. If you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. Well, I mean, it. all of it is inconsistent, naturally. Yeah. But- <laughs> Yeah. There's there's any number of directions that this tendency towards all embracing uh, inclusivity doesn't run. Mm-hmm. For instance, uh, how many of these same people are also talking about how horrible it is that uh, there's so many addicts on the street and we need to do more to help them not be addicts? Why not? They they're not hurting anyone except themselves and. Why does that matter, morally speaking? So what? It doesn't affect you. It's not harming anyone else. It's just them being an addict on the street. And, you know, maybe that's what they want. Their own melatonin and serotonin levels are higher um, in bursts, and that's what's good for them, and they're happy. Why do you want to change that? That's just their lifestyle that they've accepted for themselves. Yeah. And and it would be interesting to see the arguments. Um, I think the libertarian argument would be, uh, well, I, I think that the, the more general libertarian argument would be, you're right. Yeah, it's freedom. I think Ayn Rand, Ayn Rand I think, is is the um, holdout here. I think she would say, well, they ought to be rational. But I think you could, <laughs> I think you've hit it right in the head. Why? <laughs> they 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 like it. What's the? Well, they're not living up to their living up to their full potential. Uh huh. So. So what? <laughs> <laughs> so who died and left you God? Um, you know, it just, it doesn't work. Liberals are back and forth on this. You're right about the inconsistency. Mm-hmm. There are people who want to help them because we know better. We we enjoy a better lifestyle. We think they should. So we will tax you and use your money to help them because that's loving. And you, of course, if you're loving, you will enjoy being taxed. The conservative bit, and this is why conservatives get, get the name of being cold and heartless, will say, you know, it's kind of their problem. Um, and whereas we don't like them on the street because they are a drain on public resources and 
possible public nuisance. It may not be high on our list of things to deal with, but it's not a pleasant thing. But um, and if they if they commit a crime, the police should arrest them. Short of that, we're not right now. As far as I know, conservatives don't have a real solution. And the liberal solution is to is to empower them and give them and, and build them places where they can continue enjoying their lifestyle. There are this. I think you've hit a good one, Brian. I think this is a place where yeah. there are no answers. And we can well, even... I, there, there's definitely not a very. I'm going to go off onto a brief public policy rant sure. here apparently but th it's it's one of those <laughs> issues where there's not a straightforward answer and it kind of reveals the problem of thinking throwing money at things will fix the problems you don't right. like especially yeah. because it's a it's a problem that starts and continues its existence by means of a a lack of proper human relationship mm. and you simply do not fix that by government program fiat. Yeah. Yeah. And even on an individual basis, like one good, meaningful friendship doesn't turn a life around. It can help a lot and it's yeah. certainly better than none, but there's, you know, it's just such a massive tangled problem that leads to a person being in this situation it's not an easy fix, no, even it's if it's a lot of individuals working in private charity. Yeah. Or one individual working with the guy down the street and investing a lot of time, energy, money, and prayer. It's not that. Here's, here's the thing. There are crooked things that cannot be made straight, mm -hmm. as the wise man once said. And for the, the um, liberal point of view, that's unacceptable. Man's perfectible. Uh, if there's a problem, it's in the environment. If you fix the environment, you can fix the man. And if we haven't done that, it's because we haven't done enough research. We haven't spent enough money. We haven't tried the right technique for which we need more power. It can be fixed. Conservatives are more inclined to say, yeah, maybe not. But as the problems mount, simple the simple traditions of justice do not answer. They, they may be great as far as justice is concerned. But people have other kinds of needs. Uh, and the free market is wonderful as an economic system. But man is more than economics. And so mm -hmm. at what point do we say, yeah, that's a great way to run our economy. But we as individuals, is there nothing more that somebody someplace somehow requires of us that we ought to do, ought being a moral absolute here? And if so, who speaks this authoritative word? And non-Christian liberals, non-Christian conservatives, non-Christian libertarians have a real problem. They, they, they sometimes can see the issues. And again, I think this is a great one to talk about. But the, the, the most self-deluded, I suspect, you know, after a fashion, are the, uh, are the liberals who really think they could fix this. Because they love more. And, and, and that's the evidence that they love more than we do. Because in this view, love saves the problem is not justice. The problem is not an offended God. The problem is not guilt. The problem is things are broken and love can fix broken things if you give it enough energy, time, and tools. So if you really love like we did, like we do, you can fix this. And um, as Christians, we stand back and say, you know what? No, love is insufficient. Of course, we're still back at the, wait a minute, what is this love thing anyway? I forget. Accepting people where they are, that doesn't help. If where they are is rotten, um, pretending, no, they, 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 they've they chosen it. They must be happy. No, that doesn't work. Well, enough money will change their hearts. Um, no, it really won't. Um, how about a new drug? <laughs> no. <laughs> Bioconditioning? Uh, please no. Uh, we're, we're, we're left with this. And so we need... And what. I think what we need to kind of move toward now is to talk about the Christian doctrine of love, what it is and what it isn't, because this is a point where Christians are traditionally very confused. Before we move on, though, mm -hmm. um, we've talked in the past in the series on the Ten Commandments about how these are kind of external boundaries, the, the thou shalt nots, mm -hmm. um, that give us a bright line of what not to do because the 
is it the converse or the the flip side <laughs> of the coin? I forget the logical term, but the uh, uh, the too. corresponding yeah. thou shalt yeah. um, are more to do with the heart than than the external actions. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so interesting that even in civil law today, a charge of murder requires malice aforethought. Right. We still have to take the heart in some mm. measure into account that there's still this, you got to figure out what's going on inside that person to know whether what they did was a crime or, or more specifically murder as opposed to another kind of unlawful killing. I think that that's, that itself is rather profound. Emily. thank you. I hadn't really thought about it from that angle. I would throw this on top of it, that the law speaks as civil law speaks to a term, external actions there's no the bible recognizes no such thing as a hate crime hate sins oh yeah there are a lot mm -hmm. of those a lot of sins we do because we hate or they where the hating itself is sin but it's the bible nowhere assigns that as something the civil government should punish but you are right if the act is not motivated by hate on some level then it may it's not a crime but then we have to ask now, what's hate? Is it, we, we, we all recognize the, you stepped on my toe, I'm going to kill you, you are so dead, scream, yell, go after somebody with a knife. But how about the cold, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, we have enough people on the planet now, your number has come up, step into the gas chambers, thank you very much. Well, that's hatred, it's cold, calculating, indifferent, refusal to recognize the image of God in another human being. Uh, and, and, and so, yeah, we, we, we need to understand the commandments and all their fullness as they address the heart, not simply the hatred of the, the wild and the raging and the angry, but mm -hmm. the, the anger, the hatred that burns and explodes, but also the cold, indifferent kind of thing. Uh, Which means of, that you've desired something else more than honoring that person. Yes. I think this comes back to the covetousness as idolatry is that, you know, it might not be an, a raging, ang angry hatred against the person who you're putting in the gas chamber, but you've desired this vision for the world more than you've desired the glory of God through loving this person. The glory of God. So as we have done in every episode dealing with the Ten Commandments, I will now take us back to the doctrine of the Trinity and say nothing that you haven't heard from me a lot of times. But, you know, I grew up not hearing this, and so I'm hoping that maybe it'll catch a spark out there somehow, somewhere. It's as old as Augustine, and Jonathan Edwards has a, a couple good quotes um, repeated by um, Desiring God, um, John Piper. Uh, but let, let's let's just start with basics. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father to the Son, and from the Son to the Father. Uh, we we have plenty of passages that speak of the Father loving the Son forever, and of the Son loving the Father forever from eternity. There is no such reference with regard to the Holy Spirit in, either in terms of the Father or the Son or Him at all. And so the, it, it could, this could easily lend itself to saying, well, then maybe the Holy Spirit isn't a person. He's almost treated like some kind of alien force or something. He's, he's, he's just kind of an it. Why, why, why isn't he in their love? Why doesn't the Bible talk about him loving? Augustine's solution was to say that when the Bible says God is love, he's specifically speaking of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit, sentient, divine person, and that's everything hangs on that. If he's just a, a force or feeling, this doesn't work. But the Father gives to the Son sentient eternal deity pouring from his very heart, and the son returns it as counter breath. And that person is himself the love that binds them together. It's a Trinitarian act where when we say the father loves the son, what we're saying is that they are bound together, the father initiating by breathing forth the Holy Spirit and the son returning by breathing back the Holy Spirit. And that this is an eternal act, a necessary act, it's, uh, we, we, I think I may have said this last time or time before, we speak of giving someone our heart, but we don't, one, we don't actually cut out the, the bleeding organ and, and hand it to them. <laughs> That'd be kind of gross. But neither can we in any real sense pour out our spirit into another person. But God can. And, and there's no, there's nothing greater than this. And as we see the persons of the Trinity described 
one to another. The son loves the father and submits to his lead and to the task that he's given him. It goes even to the cross to honor him. The father loves and honors the son, delights in him, makes him the hero of the story, uh, promises to raise him from the dead and give him his spirit and give him a bride. And each gives for the sake of the other. And this is all done in the context of the person who is God, the Holy Spirit. So this kind of love, the love that gives, the love that gives selflessly, the love that gives for the glory of another, but that other isn't just any other random other. That other is God himself. God gives himself for the sake of God, uh, which has led uh, John Piper to rewrite the uh, Westminster, uh, shorter Westminster Confession to be the chief end of, of man is to love God by enjoying him forever. Because God's chief end is to love himself and for each person to love the other and to enjoy himself forever. Now, if this is the nature of love, then we have not a selfish love that turns in on itself, but an outpouring love that naturally in God pours out and then pours out in creation. God didn't have to make the world, but he delighted to do so. God didn't have to make man, but he chose freely to love someone who wasn't himself and to give him wonderfully good things, to make him in his own image and to communicate with him. Because, because that's who God is, because God is love. And when we let the Bible show us these things, then we begin to get an understanding of, of what this, of how glorifying God is loving God and how loving God is glorifying God. Here, here's a couple of quotes from um, Jonathan Edwards, who was I met one of America's earlier theologians, who I don't always agree with, but uh, these quotes are pretty good. He writes, The Holy Ghost is the divine essence flowing out and breathes forth in God's infinite love to and delight in himself. And again, so the Holy Spirit is breathed forth both from the Father and the Son by the divine essence being holy, poured, and flowing out in that infinitely intense, holy and pure love and delight that continually and unchangeably breathes forth from the Father and the Son, primarily toward each other, and secondarily toward the creature, so flying, flowing forth in a different subsistence or person in a manner to us utterly inexplicable and inconceivable, and that this is that person that is poured forth into the hearts of angels and saints. So God gives his spirit to one, each to the other, and then to us in Christ. Uh, you know, but, I was reading uh, last month in my Bible in a Year plan, I was reading the Gospel of John and John's epistles, and I was supposed to read Revelation along with that, but I'm saving it for the end because it, <laughs> it goes at the end and I just will not feel satisfied at the end of the year if I don't finish on Revelation. <laughs> but it struck me so much in this read through how the Holy Spirit is all through the Gospel of John. Oh, yeah. Um, and how the the procession from the Father and the Son is all through John. And then you get to the epistles of John, and it's God is love, God is love, God is love. Mm -hmm. Like these things go together yeah. more deeply than we can even communicate. Yeah. Did, did you notice the, a couple of the words that Edward used here? Infinitely intense, pure love and delight, continually breathed forth. Uh, poured and flowing. This is not the intellectual acknowledgement that you're a good person. This is not a legal concession that you've kept all the rules correctly and therefore are good. That That's not what this is. Um, this this is passionate. Now, we, we kind of have a problem because the, the, the confessions of the church say that God is without passion. But what that means is that he does not change. Uh, he's without parts and passions, is the uh, the formula of the Book of Common Prayer, or the 39 mm -hmm. Articles, which is true. He does not have parts, and he is not moved by passion. He does not change. He does not develop in his feelings. But that does not allow us to say that when God says he loves, that that's just a figure of speech that we can reduce to mere intellectual approval. And, and I've seen writers go that direction, a sort of rationalism that tries to bleed all of the emotion all of the commitment and the intensity out of who and what God is. Uh, yeah, we can't understand. Everything we say about God is anthropomorphic, granted. 
But the confessions also tell us, Westminster here, particularly I'm thinking of, that whatever God tells us is true not only to us, but it's true for him. It's not exhaustive truth because we're not God, but it is true truth, to borrow Schaeffer's phrase. And so when we're told that God loves us, we're not to try to rearrange that into something else that is decidedly less than human love, but to say, well, if human love can accomplish this, what can divine love accomplish? What is the nature of the love that sin causes the Father to send his son to the cross to save a spoiled, spotted bride? And we should stand in amazement. Uh, and, and once we have this kind of love in view, then we can come to the commandments and they no longer seem like so many do's and don'ts. They seem more like, oh, here are the lines that define boundaries. If I, let's take my spouse, if I love my spouse, uh, I don't want her worshiping other gods because that's unreality. I, I don't want her dragged into um, obsession with, with images and pictures that are not to God's glory. I don't want her to be breaking her oaths or people breaking oaths against her. I want her in church on Sundays. I want her to rest physically as well. I, I do not want my children to dishonor her or, or, her, or anyone to dishonor her or, or show her less than the respect she deserves for who she is. I do not want to take her life. I want her life to be happy. I want to be faithful to her and chaste and pure as I would hope that she would be for me for the same reason, because it's best for her and most loving for her. I want to tell the truth about her. I want other people to tell the truth about her. And I want these things deeply in my heart with a degree of passion that I will get up out of my chair and go do what I need to, whether it's spending a lot of money or poking someone in the nose in <laughs> order to ensure that my wife is treated this way. This this is what love looks like. Mm -hmm. But I know this because the Bible tells me so. I mean, I, I always like the phrase that comes to us from classical Christian theism of God being pure act, or the Latin purus actus. It's in line with his simplicity and in line with his uh, lacking passions, as mm -hmm. the Westminster puts it, that it's it's not that God is Im so impartial and uh, beyond us and inert that nothing's happening. Mm -hmm. It's that yeah. he is always active and yes. always, for lack of a better term, intense. It's yes. always mm -hmm. flowing out of him in a, in a pure act of yeah. his own essence flowing out from himself. Yeah. And so uh, Augustine ends his confessions with, with a confession very near unto what you just said. Always active, always at rest. He's both. Uh, he, re he finds rest and, and peace and comfort in himself because he's constantly pouring out himself into, in, into governing creation and saving his people. Of course, forever he, he begets his son and brings forth his spirit. He is sheer action. He's not sheer passivity. And so when we come here, uh, and, and this kind of brings us back to where we started, it's not enough to say, well, we just need to get rid of passion. That's it. We just need to be moderate in all of our, of our dealings and feelings. We never get excited about anything. That's not it. You, you read the life of Jesus. He got excited about stuff. Uh, he came to save his bride. He got really angry. You know, and some people think, no, Jesus, yes, he got angry. Uh, Bible says so. And I, there are I just ahead. had this this mental image of that meme where there's this little boy and he's found a puppy and he just carries it around to everybody saying, look at this, it's so cute. And it just never occurred to me that Jesus as a young boy might have gotten really excited about, you know, wholesome things. Because yeah. like, yeah, wow. Sorry, that was a yeah. little bit of a tangent. Well, no, I, th I think that no, I think that's really good because I'd never thought about that either. But you know, there probably were times when Joseph or Mary brought home, I don't know, Marie's donuts and slammed <laughs> over the table, and little Yeshua said, "Father, mother, you know I love them so much. Thank you." We, we can't perceive it. It's like, yes, father unit, mother unit. I appreciate. <laughs> your feeble attempts at uh, satisfying my hunger, but know that I have a meat to eat you know not have. You know, <laughs> no, he, he, he was a real boy. 
And he played and he got excited and he prob probably didn't love dogs because they were unclean. And, oh, yeah. But, you know, little, little little sheep. Um, Sheepies for, are so cute. I, every know. time I see a picture of a lamb, I'm like, look at those little fuzzy knees. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> and so what, who and what God is does not draw us away from the, from the idea of, of earthly passion, but it does show us that God in all of his passion never deviates from his chief end, which is to glorify himself. The Father glorifies the Son, the Son glorifies the Father, the Spirit glorifies the Son, so the Son can glorify the Father. And God invites us into that. And it's not selfishness to do so, because uh, there's nothing better than God. God cannot set some other end for us and say, well, I seek my own self being self-interested, but oh, I know, you seek your own self-interest, and we'll be just alike. <laughs> no. No. God can command us to seek his interest because he's God, infinite in his perfections, glorious in his attributes. There is the highest good, the, the, the perfection of perfection. And he's a real person who wants to talk to us and, and share love with us. There's nothing better. Mm -hmm. And so all of our desires need to be wrapped up in that. The psalmist uh, says a number of things, but here are just two of them, Psalm 73. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart, my portion forever. Or one that's maybe more familiar because there used to be praise chorus. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? When God becomes our primary, nay, our exclusive desire, then all other desires that can be subsumed within that become legitimate. Mm. When I want something for God's sake and for his glory, because I love him, and I love him biblically as his law defines love, then my desire, however passionate, is a good desire. But when I deviate, when I want something alongside of God, something beside God, something other than God, God plus something else, then I got problems because God will not tolerate idols. And as you said, Emily, this brings us all the way back to the first. We are to love God with our whole heart and soul and mind. And that doesn't leave room for any other gods before his face. But when we can take every good thing and every good gift and every good opportunity in, in terms of his glory, we have a whole world to enjoy and to desire. And have fun with, and it's okay. Mm -hmm. It's not just okay; it's good. It's holy. It's it's actually what he it's commands. Great. Yeah, he commands us to be happy as long as we're happy on his terms. Mm -hmm. uh, and at this point, uh, C.S. Lewis, of course, has got to come to mind. The weight of glory. <laughs> and the quotation I'm, I, I assume you're both familiar with. Lewis writes this: If there lurks in most modern minds the notion that to desire our own good and to earnestly hope for the enjoyment of it is a bad thing. I suggest that this notion has crept in from Kant and the Stoics, and is no part of the Christian faith. Indeed, if we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We're half-hearted creatures fooling around with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at sea. We are far too easily pleased. Hmm. So again, there are many things that God commands us to want, but he commands us all to want them in terms of wanting him first centrally and in a sense exclusively every other want every other desire has to be in terms of our prior commitment love and desire for god himself it's a you know it's it's a it's a trick question i actually asked my kids at school this the other day what is it what is the greatest gift that god has to give us redemption salvation his kingdom his covenant forgiveness no finally someone said it himself and sometimes, particularly in Calvinist circles, we kind of forget that because I'm not sure where that falls exactly in the locus of systematic theology. We should be, it should be under point one when we start talking <laughs> about who God is. 
should be it should be in the points of salvation when we talk about why is God saving us anyway, particularly sanctification and glorification. But it's not something that I've heard a lot in Reform Church. Maybe maybe you two have different experiences. What do you think? Well, you, you were my high school systematics teacher, so <laughs> don't blame me too my much. My experience was certainly not yours. <laughs> now, okay. I do appreciate one one question on a test. Well, I appreciate a lot of the questions that you put on tests, <laughs> but one that I remember learning something from. You know, when you you can learn something through the lectures right. and through the studying, but then when it's on the test, you really it clicks. You know, one mm -hmm. of those was what is the heart of God's covenant in every age? And ah. it's, he shall be to us a God and we shall be to him a people. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 I, I'm very critical of, of children, let alone grownups, who when you ask them what the gospel is or what it means to be saved, they say, well, you get to die and go to heaven to be with Jesus. I mean, yes, you do. And that's a wonderful, glorious truth. But sometimes I'm not so sure that those of us with reform leanings get much further to be justified, sanctified, glorified, which it means to be raised from the dead, free from sin. <laughs> yes, again, that's all wonderful and that's glorious and that's true. And if it weren't true, the rest wouldn't follow. But how about loving and being loved by God for all eternity? It's the being with Jesus that's the heart yeah. of that, yeah. the simple yeah. answer. Yeah. To be and not, it's Jesus. not the heaven part, it's the with Jesus. Yeah, and, and insofar as that's what you're saying, that may even be in some ways a better answer than the more technically accurate reformed answers. Unless the form, reformed answers like go reach all the way, and I'm sure they do for, for many people, to well, what you said, to being with Jesus. And, and certainly the more technically complex and accurate answer rightfully has at its center that it is because God gives himself to us that we right. have these things in the first place. So I th probably somewhere along the line, we get focused on the individual trees of the forest yeah. Yeah. and and forget yeah. that we're, we're looking at God giving himself to us and it's working it out in this birch and that pine and this oak. <laughs> I like the analogy, but I think, I think you're absolutely right. I think that's what's going on. We, we lose our way as we watch one step at a time, mm -hmm. where, where, where are we? Where's God taking us? And wait, who is this God who's taking us? Why is he taking us? By what authority? What are his intentions? Those are questions well, we should have asked up front. And we don't always. And some we day, definitely lose do. sight of it. If you focus too much on how badly you're doing. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, or how how good you think you're doing? Oh, they're, they're the yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Those are the two because, options. We were, we're yeah. <laughs> because the two words there are the one word you. Yeah, how am I doing? How badly am I doing? How well am I doing? Well, you know, this is not exactly your story, I, except indirectly, it's a God story. I forget who I says it, but it'll probably come to me tomorrow. But anyway, there's a. <laughs> A pastor who says, you know, the the thing that makes your salvation strong is not, or that makes your faith strong is not your faith, but it's the object of your faith. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and then we have to, we have to think, this, this child is coming back to mind, or this child making mud pies. I'm sure <laughs> the guys, no, imagine a lot of water, like this water splish splash. No, there's a lot more of it. And he's still imagining muddy water. You're not getting to him <laughs> because of his preconceptions of what all of these words mean. And, and, and it is, it is, I am a, I'm a creedalist and a confessionalist. I make no apologies ever for these and have gotten more flack over both probably than most people do. <laughs> and yet having said that, if we don't meet the God whom the confessions describe and point us to, we've missed everything. And I know for me, that's a trap. It's easy for, I'm, I'm something of an intellectual, I can tend toward rationalism. And it's easy for me to lose Jesus in the midst of all of the true things I know about him. Not because they're not true, but because as you say, I look at this tree and that tree and this tree, and I forget. It's like I look at this pixel and that pixel and this pixel, and I forget whose face these pixels show me. So passionate love for God. But not a literal Jesus. picture. Not, but not a literal <laughs> picture. Yes, yes. Second commandment. Second commandment. Oh. 
Well, there are other things we could talk about, but I don't know. I think we've done pretty well. I mean, we can condemn. I, I think we already did this. We can condemn socialism as legalized covetousness and mm -hmm. fascism and Marxism and the Robin Hood mentality and anybody who wants to take my stuff and give it to someone else because that's loving. I, at this point, I think we can say, yeah, no, that's not loving. You want to help this person? Hey, why don't you help them? Why don't you take with your, own your stuff. stuff with your own stuff? Yeah, mm -hmm. you could do that. Or you could convince me that this is a genuine need. You can come over and talk to me like a real person and, and show me by your own giving, your own sacrifice, that this is worthy of imitation. You can even start a club or an organization bent on helping this person or fixing the situation. It's called volunteerism. Mm. It used to be very strong in America until social welfare kicked in as a way of keeping politicians in power. Uh, but of, of course, the, the liberal objection is, well, that's too little, too late, and, and why why do that when we have this power here? Because <laughs> nobody gave we me the power. We have the ring. Why not use it? <laughs> we have the ring. Why not use it? Yeah, exactly. And the other thing that comes to mind, too, uh, specifically about social welfare and social programs and all this stuff that, you know, certainly there's probably some good that have come about because of these things. Yeah. But if we're also going to keep love of neighbor at the center of our minds, I I can't imagine that there's a lot of communication to the to the person using these particular social welfare things where they go, I feel loved by the people who pay taxes yeah. for this. No, because they don't. there's so many layers of separation between mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know the the funds being siphoned from your paycheck automatically. Um, yeah. And then going through 37 layers of actuaries to to the paycheck that they get to anonymously help this person. At the end. Yeah, yeah. There, there's so many separations there that I, I can't imagine somebody on the receiving end of that thinks I am loved by someone who gave their time and money to me. Yeah. Yeah. No, there is. There's nothing. Of, there's nothing human about it. It's mm -hmm. cold and distant and bureaucratic. And to pretend that this is love, it frees us from so much. I never have to walk down the street and go shake the hands of that scraggly, scrawny, smelly homeless man down there and, and, and sit down and actually have a real conversation with him and when his mind isn't all clear. And I don't, the stuff, of, half the stuff he's talking about, I, it's not my world. I don't know. It's easier just to have someone deduct things automatically from my paycheck because now I've loved. They say I have. Mm -hmm. They've taken my money. They they are putting it where they know best because they know more than I do. And I never have to get involved in a way that demands anything of me, that takes mm -hmm. me out of my comfort zone, or that really tests me in any human way. And yet it's good and enough because... You, yeah. And you can't use those dollars to then love and serve your family or your wife or your church or anybody else because those dollars have been taken in the name yeah. of love to help those people. It's entirely yeah. taken away the actual moral choice for you. Right. Yeah, to there is, the there extent is no of approximately 33% of your income. Yeah. 33% of my the time I invest, the energy I invest in earning income is taken from me, bare, not even really in my name, in the name of the taxpayer at best, more often in the name of a particular federal service program. <laughs> or state or county service program that may or may not have the face of some nice lady or some grumpy guy who shows up now <laughs> and then to do very little in most cases, sometimes because they really do care, but they're just overloaded with work and often because they don't care. And they're just going through the forms. And sometimes because they're burned out because they cared once and they just can't care can't anymore do. because they're bearing the burden that should be the love of thousands of people and it's all on their shoulders. Yeah. And 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 they can't do that. That's that's beyond mm -hmm. any reasonable human thing. And and so it is very sad. Uh we 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 speak for love. But love has got to be human and it's got to be a choice. It's got to be passionate. It's got to care. We have to care. We have to care enough to get up out of our chairs, to deny ourselves, to give up our stuff, our time, our energy. There has so to be that, a cost that isn't just monetary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Most people don't even 
notice how much is taken out of their paycheck. That's another thing. Yeah. Don't get me started on <laughs> employer withholdings. It, it's, um, inter- yeah. it's interesting to watch kids get their first job as a high school teacher. I'm often nearby. And, and everyone, as they open that first paycheck and see the withholdings, they start, <laughs> who's FICA and why does he get my money? And you know, things <laughs> like that. They're ready to start a tax revolt right then and there. But, you know, it wears off and you get used to it. You accept that this is the way the world is. But that money is used to buy votes and power and other things. And so we have to stop and say, wait, but is that loving? Aren't you just using these people? Oh, no, I really care. Funny how really caring looks like political manipulation at the same time. It's great you got those two to come out together. That (laughs) must have taken a while. (laughs) Very convenient. All right, we gotta stop. We gotta switch over to Recos. Okay. Uh, yeah, right. that's right. Do you have anything for us, Greg? Well, since I brought it up, I don't know if I've recommended it yet, but John Piper's Desiring God. All right. Meditations of a Christian Hedonist. Uh, he got a lot of flack for messing around with the words of the uh, of the Shorter Catechism, but he goes at length to show no, that's what the Catechism actually means. Mm-hmm. It does not ask what are the chief ends of man to love God or to glorify God and to enjoy him, but the chief end, it's one end, one goal. And these are just the two sides of it. And so when we truly uh, desire God and enjoy God, we are glorifying him the most. Everybody glorifies God. Uh, the wrath of men shall praise thee. The people in hell glorify God by suffering, but the greatest glory that we bring to God is in knowing him and enjoying him and loving him for who he is. And so that's what the book's about. It's a little thick, but it's easily written with a few profound quotes from older authors. And it's something that uh, you can nitpick on, but I think every Christian will find of great worth. Cool. Brian? Um, I think this time I will recommend uh, a book that I just finished for the first time. And you can stop me if I mentioned this last time which is uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas <laughs> Adams. Uh, I'm almost you... positive you mentioned it, but I don't think it was a reco. So it wasn't a reco, no, so go ahead. Perfect. <laughs> it is, if you can get the audiobook, it's read by Stephen Fry, which is just as hilarious <laughs> as you can imagine it is. It's a classic of science fiction and a little bit opposed to what the purpose of this podcast is, I suppose, but it's entertaining <laughs> enough, and you can kind of uh, skim past that in your own mental reckoning of the storyline. Well, we have co-opted many favorite lines yeah. for our own purposes. So we want I, to... <laughs> I, I once had a pastor tell me that it was uh, a blasphemous book because his son had picked it up off my shelf at school and I removed it from the shelf and apologized. But I, I suspect looking back that he simply didn't understand sarcasm for what it was. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> or satire yeah it's there, there are there are times when the author does mention things like proofs for god but he's not being serious he's mocking how shallow we are in our thinking so i which is valid which is valid many many yeah. many cases i do love his um portrayal of philosophers and deep thinkers. Oh, yes. Which oh, yes. I know. I know it's such a stereotype to, uh, it's an accurate stereotype to call them head in the clouds, ivory tower folks, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's so great. Yeah. All right, Emily, what's yours? Cool. Cool. Um, I'm going to recommend listening, <laughs> just listening. I was thinking a lot about this. I, my dad talks about this a lot, that a lot of his work is just listening to people. He's a CISM instructor, uh, Critical Incident Stress Management, which means that he helps teach people how to help when people go through really rough things. And he says, a lot of what I teach is just be a better elephant than you are a hippopotamus, is his way of putting it, because <laughs> elephants have two big ears <laughs> and hippopotami have one big mouth. (laughs) Um, And and I was thinking... Two little ears. And two little ears, yes. The hippopotamus ears are small, especially (laughs) compared to the elephant ears. (laughs) And I was thinking about this, uh, especially in regards to conversations along the lines that we've talked about in the last couple episodes, postmodernism and socialism and stuff, where 
people don't have the answers, but you can't tell them that they don't have the answers. <laughs> that shuts down <laughs> the conversation. Um, and it's much better. And you grow as a person from listening to people who mm -hmm. disagree with you. And you can learn something from people who are wrong. Um, and I think it's important for the sake of the friendship, unless you're in like a professional stage debate, um, <laughs> which most of us are not most of the time. Most of the time, these conversations happen organically in friendships. And I think it's really important to listen to the other person and ask them the questions of like, okay, so why do you think that? And not just skip to, no, you don't have any answers and I have all of them. <laughs> so whether it's, you know, critical incident stress management or talking about socialism or whatnot, I recommend listening. It's, it's fun that way. And you get friends. You keep friends. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing. Uh, quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good recommendation. Good Thanks. stuff. All right. Thanks so much for this conversation. We've made it to the last of the Ten Commandments. Um, but we're not done with them. They will come back to haunt us um, in future episodes. Uh, but thank you to you, our listeners, for sticking, sticking with us. Um, thanks for going back and listening to old episodes. A lot of people have been doing that. Um, some of our top episodes in the last couple of weeks have been old episodes. So everybody's oh, really, doing the Emily, right thing. Which ones are these? Yes. These are our episodes on... Oh, goodness. I can't pull them up in front of me because my web browser's not working. <laughs> um, but our whole series on the Trinity, on... Um, all the foundations okay, of where good. we started dominion and sociology of dominion and those are two different episodes which i hadn't realized <laughs> <laughs> until these past couple weeks anyway uh thank you also to david our producer and my lawfully wedded husband uh, he makes us sound smart which i appreciate because i need that uh, <laughs> thanks to our financial supporters we appreciate you helping keep the show running we hope to see you next week. Bye.